did not know a netty bottle, um, which is right here, and that or netty bottle uh, very well. Uh, but I married into the family in 1958, uh, a week after she died. So uh, my uh, knowledge of her is not as intimate as many of these other people's, but. Um, I have read an awful lot of her letters and heard an awful lot of stories about Grandmother Pottle. Uh, she was known as Nettie. Uh, I would probably <coughs> call her grandmother because that's the way I knew her. Okay, we're going to get, I'm going to give an introduction and then the experts here are going to um, fill in about their parent or the per person who they are representing. Uh, Ann Watson is uh, going to talk about John K. Pottle, although she is not John Pottle's daughter, she is his niece. Chris Pottle, next to him, her, is going to talk about his father, Fred Pottle. Jean Pottle Poland, who is also not really a Pottle at all, but knows an awful lot about the Pottles. Uh, Jean Paul Poland is going to talk about her father, her former father-in-law, Moulton Potter. And uh, then I am going to talk about Nellie Hankins. Then Callie, who is sitting on the end, is going to talk about her mother, Estelle Potter, Estelle Pottle Stone, who many of you know. Okay, we're going to start, I said I'm going to give an introduction and then turn it over to these experts. When Otis Field farmer Roy Pottle died in 1914, his death left his wife Nettie, a widow at the age of 41. She had very limited resources, she had five children, ranging in from 19 to 7. She had no savings account, no social security, no automobile, no occupation beyond that of housewife, and no wealthy relatives to provide help. She did possess an old farmhouse, which is the house that Callie now lives in. Uh, she did possess an old farmhouse, 100 acres of farmland, an old horse, some sure land that wasn't worth anything at all then, and a strong personality. Perhaps most important, she had a strong belief that the family's future lay in acquiring a good education. She also believed that somehow by depending on each other, the members of the Pottle family, her children, would survive. Some families at that time faced in this kind of a situation would simply break apart. The Pottles of Otisfield stuck together and managed to pull through the rather dark days of the 1920s and 1930s. Nellie, uh, Nettie Pottles saw all five graduate from Colby College, all five happily married, all five embarked on teaching careers. Along the way, one of their Colby classmates gave the family a nickname which was partly a joke and partly a recognition of their accomplishments. That nickname was the Illustrious Pottles. <laughs> Nettie, whose formal name was Annette Kemp, was born in 1875 on Scribner Hill, not in the house I live in, but on the spot I live in. On Scribner Hill, there was an older house before ours. She was one of nine children born to Albert and Sarah Kemp. The house she was born in was torn down in 1888 and replaced by what is now my big house. Nettie's father, like many of the men in Otisfield, made his living in a number of ways. Growing crops, raising chickens, lumbering, raising apples for export, and working in the Kemp Brothers' sawmill, which was right here in Puckleville. Uh, somehow he had enough money to send his, his daughter, Nettie, I think it was the only one he sent off to school, he sent Nettie to board in Bridgeton, where she attended Bridgeton Academy and met Roy Pottle, whose name really was Fred the Roy Pottle, son of a farmer from the town of Lovell. Uh, not very many local farmers sent their children off to a boarding school this time. 
Nettie and Roy Pottle were only two, were two of the only seven people graduating from their uh, Richmond Academy class in 1893, where they studied, among other things, algebra, Latin, English, rhetoric, all not too useful for farming kids. They married in 1894 at the very young ages of 20 and 19. They lived first in Lovell before moving to Otisfield just before their third son was born in 1899. In Otisfield, they settled on the 100-acre farm once owned by William Taylor Scrivener. This farm is now located at Stonehurst Road and owned by Callie and Joe Zielinski. It is known by Pottle descendants as Pottle's Cross. There, the young couple settled down to a familiar <coughs> life of farming and child raising with one unusual form of entertainment. According to one of Nettie's grandsons, the young couple, perhaps inspired by their years at Bridgeton Academy, spent their evening sitting at a kitchen table with kerosene lamp, studying classical Greek. <laughs> this perhaps illustrates Nettie Powell's intellectual curiosity and her, also her faith in family. She was used to a large family, to net, what I call family networking. She was one of nine children. Her father, Albert, and her uncle, Charles, both married sisters, Wardwell sisters, and settled beside each other on Scribner Hill. So you have uh, two brothers and two sisters as neighbors with 16 children between them. The 16 children ran back and forth between the two places, and they did not really know where, which house they belonged to. Uh, so, Nettie understood family networking in a way that probably none of us do. After her husband's death, Nettie's first concern was to see her children educated. And I'm going to let each of these people in turn um, tell about that. I'm just going to give a little uh, basic discussion of Nettie herself and what she did as, a, as an adult, as a widow. Um, the first few years after her husband's death, two or three years, she apparently taught school here in East Otisfield, in the little one-room schoolhouse that was down there somewhere, um, which I think this building was made out of. Her boys at that point were uh, two oldest boys, or maybe three oldest boys, were off at Colby. Uh, then, after two years, she took her two daughters, who were then 13 and 10, Nellie and Estelle, 13 and 10, off to Hebrew. She became a house mother, and I think she may have taught kindergarten, and the girls attended school at Hebrew for four years. Estelle did not uh, graduate, Estelle Pottle did not graduate from Hebrew, but, but Nellie did. In the fall of 1922, Nellie, her older daughter, went off to Colby. At this point, Nettie left Hebron. She still had Stell with her. She left Hebron and with her youngest daughter, Estelle. She moved to Durham, New Hampshire, where she moved in with her son, Fred, and his wife. This is a part of the family network. So Estelle went to school there. A year later, she moved again. This time she moved to Winthrop, Maine, where her oldest son, John, was now teaching at Winthrop High School. Okay. The following year, she moved to up to the academy, where her oldest, where her third son, Moult, was now headmaster. So she is moving every year to a different place. Uh, meanwhile, daughter Nellie had graduated from Colby and was teaching at Spelman College. I'm going to talk about that later. In Atlanta, Georgia, Grandmother Pottle moves to Atlanta, Georgia for one year where she becomes a housewife. 
So she is living, okay, one year in, from Hebron, she goes to Durham, New Hampshire, and then she goes to Winsford, Maine, and then she goes to the Academy, and then she goes to Atlanta, Georgia, five, five different places in five years. And the next year, um, she was only there, she was only in Atlanta one year. The next year, Stell was a senior at Colby. Grandmother moves back. She is now moving back to Waterville. She and Stell moved in with Dean Mariner and his wife and took care of their children. They, she boarded there, in other words. So grandmother was earning a little money all the time, not much. Uh, she was getting bored in room and taking care of her kids. She was taking very close care of her kids. This was the pattern that grandmother had. And once all her kids were through college, then she finally came back to Otisfield. It had been 10 years. She had been wandering from place to place, sort of like the Jews wandering through Israel. Uh, grandmother was doing this. Um, she moved back to um, um, Otisfield. Uh, Kelly will fill us in later on, on, on her mother, but basically she moved back with her daughter, Stel, who was not married until she was 31. And Stel, but Stel was moving around, too. Um, grandmother was pretty much back, but not really back. She would spend, um, she would travel to Kansas and spend four months living with the Hankins family. She would then go down to New Haven for three months with the Pottle family in New Haven. She would go to Mechanic Falls to live with John. Uh, she spent some time in Otisville, but she really was moving around, networking with her kids. Uh, this went on for years and years and years. Um, and I don't know when she stopped this, this traveling around. Uh, I know she was always a very uh, welcome person to arrive. Callie says that uh, they were always very glad when she came home, home to Otisfield after traveling to Kansas or um, around. I'm going to show a few pictures and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, This is Annette as, as an older person. Alright, this is um, this is Annette and Roy with their three children. This is Moat Nellie, my mother-in-law, and Fred. Notice the ribbons. I think these ribbons on the boy, and the lace on the boy's shirt. Um, uh, very uh, fancy clothes uh, for, for that time. This is taken about, uh, do I have a date? 1906, I said. Kind of judging from the age. Um, here is a later picture of all five children. Yeah, taken uh, in front, this is Callie's house. This is John, Fred, Moat, Nellie, and Stel. This is uh, probably when Nellie graduated well, I don't know when it was. Um, this again is Grandmother Pottle. This is Moat. This is John, Moat, Fred, Nellie, and Estelle. And that is the, the last picture I am going to show for now. And I'm going to turn this over to Anne, who is going to tell us a little bit about Uncle John Pottle. And do you want to do you, you want to sit no. down or do you want to come up? I'm going to I'm going to stand up because I don't have a very loud voice. If you can't hear me, please tell me. I always get told that I don't speak loudly enough, and I'm a teacher, so. John Kemp Potter was born here in 1875 in Lovell, Maine, where his parents lived after graduating from Virginia Academy. They moved to Otisfield when Potter was a toddler. He walked daily from the Pottle Homestead to Oxford High School until his graduation in 1910. 
The eldest of six children, he pitched in to help when his father died in 1914. He worked off and on in sawmills and in teaching positions until with the urging of family and his high school principal, John L. Dyer, he entered Colby College. He earned money to help pay for college by ushering at the local movie theater. It took him seven years to complete his studies, and he graduated in 1918. Paul met his wife, Sarah McManus, while teaching at Ricker College in Holton, Maine. They married in 1919, but never had children. From there, he went on to Lee Academy, where he became the principal. In just four years, he grew the school enrollment from 55 to 100 students. To supplement his income, Pottle worked for the Phoenix Life Insurance Company from 1924 to 1927. When offered the position of principal at Mechanic Falls High School during the Depression years, he jumped at the opportunity. The young couple built their first home in Mechanic Falls, where they stayed for nearly 12 years. Paul was quoted as saying that during those years, times were hard and teachers got pay cuts instead of raises. <coughs> he also worked in the woods and helped build log cabins. His wages when he was building were $4 a day. In early 1940, Pottle bought a home in Otisfield and entered local politics. He served 12 terms as a selectman and one term in the legislature, which he disliked immensely. He said he was offended by power struggles among factions competing for recognition at the state level. Is that familiar? <laughs> John K. Paul was perhaps best known for his thoughtful handling of his role as town meeting moderator, a post he held without a break for 44 years. It was said he had a special knack for cooling the heated tempers and soothing the hurt feelings which invariably rose during a town meeting. In 1953, Pottle decided to return to teaching. My personal involvement with my Uncle John as a teacher began in 1955. My siblings and I planned to go to the university in Orono, but we needed two years of language to meet the entrance requirements. When I was ready to start high school, neither Casco or Oxford, our closest schools, offered a language course. Enter John K. Pottle, who had language skills. I transferred to Casco High School and studied French from Uncle John. He was quite formal in class, always addressing me as Miss Stone. He was also my basketball and softball coach, where I was addressed simply as Stone, usually when I screwed up some play. He could and did teach pretty much anything he was asked to. My siblings and I often rode to school with him when our old pickup truck wasn't working. John Hoddle left Casco High School after nine years, went to Oxford High School for four, and he retired in 1967. They moved from their farm to a trailer on the Bell Hill Road. Aunt Sarah said the old homestead was just requiring too much care. To quote Bittersweet Magazine, he was a faithful patriarch, respected, trusted, appreciated by all. In our extended family, Uncle John was the final voice in most discussions. We looked up to him and valued his advice. He died after a short hospital stay in 1979. And my cousin Christopher tells me that he found a little research, which I hadn't happened upon, that uh, Uncle John wasn't above riding the rails to get back and forth from Kobe College. Riding underneath freight cars. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to just say a word about Uncle Fred uh, before I turn over to Chris. Uh, this is Fred and his wife Mary, also taken in front of the same house. The Mel Elm Tree is showing this. Uh, Fred was um, Phi Beta Kappa from Colby College. He was the only one of the five whose obituary was printed in the New York Times, I believe, um, as a, a distinguished professor at Yale. Uh, but the interesting thing to me is, is what it says about him. In the Colby College yearbook, you know how under your picture they often have uh, a little a little remark about somebody uh, uh, class cut up or something like this. Well, under Uncle Fred, it says, um, "Behold the infant prodigy." So I'm you. Well, my cousins and I haven't rehearsed any of this, so there may be some repetition. You'll notice. 
Uh, I'm Christopher Pottle, the son of the second child in this illustrious family. Uh, <coughs> this, uh, son of the second child, Fred Albert Pottle. You know his name, Fred Albert Pottle. I'm going to come back to that. I know very little about Fred's childhood, and what I do know comes from the story Nani Petty and Mr. Flint. Hand published as one of a series of Christmas presents made by Nellie Pottle Hankins, her husband John, and their children. Uh, I believe they, the family, were in Lovell at the time. It's a, uh, Nani is John, John Nani. Petty is Fred. And Mr. Flint is the bottom of a grape basket on a chain that Nani dragged around with him everywhere he went. Uh, <clears throat> they uh, moved to Pottles Crossing in the early 1900s. I guess we heard actually it was 1899. Fred went to grade school in Pugliville, as did his brothers and sisters, and entered Oxford High School in 1909. He usually walked to Oxford. We heard that John did that too, but never took me for the walk he used to make to get there over Canada Hill. Uh, at Oxford High School, he excelled in public speaking and debate, and graduated in 1913. Uh, he particularly admired the principal at the time, Mr. Dyer. That's the second time we've heard about him. He taught at the Swampville School for a few months over here uh, beyond the Bolsters Mills Road. Uh, for a few months before starting at Colby College a couple of years after John Kay. Uh, at Colby, Fred measured, measured in chemistry and was known for his ability in drama and debate. He earned his keep as a night boiler fireman in Foss Hall, uh, and, uh, uh, which was the women's dormitory. In a famous lecture he delivered every year at Yale to his romance poets class, he described sitting under a tree at Colby in the spring of 1917 reading Keats and Shelley and undergoing a conversion. His interest turned to English literature. He became an Anglican, Episcopalian, certainly partly influenced by his Oxford classmate at Oxford High School, Ann Colby, Marion Starbird, who, persuaded by her friend Mary Isabel Corning, who spent summers at Highfields, where we live now, was confirmed into the <laughs> Episcopal Church the minute she got to Colby. His Colby yearbook is on the table here, you just saw it. He taught in the fall of 17 at the Hebron Academy, but rushed to enlist in November 17. He spent World War I as a hospital orderly with Evacuation 8 in France in the thick of things, which he recounts in his book Stretchers, which we have a copy of here, published in 1929. Stretchers was acclaimed as one of the best true accounts from World War I. Discharged in the summer of 1919, he got a teaching job at Deering High in Portland uh, to raise some funds before entering Yale Graduate School and marrying Marion Starter in 1920. Uh, the new, new couple soon found themselves unexpectedly about to become parents, not planned, <laughs> causing him to drop out of Yale and taking a teaching job at the University of New Hampshire in Durham heard how his mother visited them there, stayed with them. One of his duties at the University of New Hampshire was to umpire debating teams from high schools all over New Hampshire. He was able to get to any of these places in New Hampshire in a day by train. His daughter Annette was born in July 1921, but came down with spinal meningitis and died a year later in August 1922. Uh, he continued to teach at, in Durham through June 23. Uh, on the table here is the essay called the Annette, the Annette, the Annette. No, I'm sorry. This is on the first syllable. The Annette, which he wrote just after her death to help deal with their grief. I never knew about this essay until we were cleaning out the house in New Haven after my parents' death. They went back to Yale in 1923, where Fred received his PhD on James Boswell in 1925 under my godfather, Chauncey Brewster Tinker, and immediately became an instructor at Yale. Noted in the Colby yearbook here is Fred Albert, 
and on the cover of Stretchers, he is Frederick Albert. Tinker advised him he simply couldn't be a professor with a name like Fred. <laughs> they just changed it. Fred became a full professor of English in 1932 and Sterling professor in 1940. His sister Nellie and John Hankins met as graduate students in the Yale English Department, and many others in future generations went there as a result of this beginning. Uh, I'll end the story about Annette Kemp. Nettie. Grandmother was considered by all of us cousins to be kindly, loving, and industrious, but not particularly humorous. My brother Sam, as a young teenager, came home one day after a visit with his grandmother. Can you guess what she asked me, he said incredulously. She asked me what the origin of St. Vitus' dance was. I said, I didn't know, and she replied it was a Scotsman outside a pay toilet. <laughs> Is that the end of the story? <laughs> 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 Moving on to uh, that's a wonderful line. Moving on to uh, the third third child in the family, Molten Pottle, uh, shown here with that elm tree at Pottle's Crossing uh, and the same house. And uh, this is his wife Winifred and their first child, Miriam. Uh, Molt was expected by many of the family to take over the Kemp brothers' mill, or at least to show an interest in it, and it didn't quite work out that way. Um, Kemp, uh, Molt, I call him Kemp, Molt uh, instead became a, uh, spent his whole professional life as a teacher at the academy. Uh, his son John is sitting right here in the front row and surrounded by John. And uh, <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, Malt, um, I, I did not know Malt very well, but Jean probably knew him much, whose daughter in law she was, no, she was much better, so I'll let her. Yes, it was my pleasure to know my father in law. Um, I met him uh, late in his life after he had developed Parkinson's disease. So it's always interesting to know someone when they're older and then find out about when they were younger. And I always thought that Walt looked a lot like F. Scott Fitzgerald. If you look at him, he looked very literary and very handsome. Um, he was born in <clears throat> excuse me, 1899 and uh, had a number of very intelligent uh, siblings before him. Uh, he followed the family's uh, idea of education, going on to to uh, school and then going on to Colby in 1916 after graduating as valedictorian of his high school class. Um, his career at Colby was shortened when he left to go in the Navy in 1917 at the same time as Uncle Fred. It's hard for me to call all of these people, like my father-in-law's real name is Albanus Moulton Harlow. And from the first time I met him, he wanted to be called Moat. So it's not disrespectful on my part. And I can't call Fred Pottle Fred. I have to call him Uncle Fred and Aunt Estelle. It's all very much, names are very important in the Pottle family. Uh, one of the outstanding names being, of course, John. But we'll get back to Moat. <laughs> so he left to go in the Navy and made 28 crossings of the Atlantic Ocean. And what I found fascinating, uh, with all his talent, he ended up uh, chuckling coal in the very bottom of a ship. 28 crossings at the time period just before we went into World War I. Uh, he picked up the name Gadget while he was in the Navy, and no one, including his son, can tell me exactly why he was called Gadget. We suspect Maine men are generally pretty handy. You know, most Maine men can do all kinds of interesting things. And so perhaps when he was in the Navy, he showed his skill as a gadget in his ear. I don't know. But he became gadget, and apparently when he came, went back to Colby to graduate uh, four years later, he was still known as gadget. When he uh, left Colby, as Jean mentioned, he had intended to come back to Otisfield and take over the uh, mills, the Pottle Mills. Um, economic times were tough then. It wasn't a good time to do that. And I don't think anyone is sure exactly what happened. 
But at that particular moment, Uncle John, who was at Lee Academy, decided that he wanted to make a move, as Anne had mentioned earlier, and thought what a perfect position for his brother Moult. And you can see how the family interacted. Fred and Moult are in the Navy. John is in Lee, now Moult is going to Lee, and it, it, it was, the, the ties were very, very close. He went to Lee Academy where he met his wife-to-be, Winifred, in 1930. Let me check my date to be sure. He met, he went to Colby in 19, I'm sorry, to Lee Academy in 1923, taking over from John. Mel, met his future wife, Winifred, and uh, they were married. What I found fascinating when I first came into the family was, uh, about Mo was what he did at the academy. As you've already heard, Uncle John had expanded the population of the school. And Mo went one step further. He decided that there were a lot of children, kids in that area, extended area, who were not having an opportunity for an education. He would get in his car, according to my brother-in-law, each fall or summer, and go forth into all the little towns in northern Maine, encouraging parents to send their children to Lee Academy. And as a result, the school grew and became quite well known in that end of the world. And as a result of that, in 1943, Colby recognized him with an honorary degree. Now, I can't find it written that it was because of what he did at Lee, but one has to assume that it probably was because he brought education to so many people. While, I've got to just put a little note in here, while Moult and Winifred were living at Lee Academy, um, it was a very, very small town, um, a general store, the school itself, and my mother-in-law, Winifred, and Moult became the social likes of the community. Winifred was determined that young ladies who went to the academy were going to learn how to attend a tea and to drink tea properly and to use a napkin and do all the proper things that one should do. And so she gave teas on a regular basis. You can imagine in this little bitty town what people were sort of, what they must have thought at that time about this young woman who rushed in and sort of changed the social life of a community. They were very successful there and they stayed there until 1950. Um, 1952, sorry. In 1952, John Stockbridge graduated from high school, right? Yeah. And at the same time, my husband Kemp graduated from Colby. And at that point, um, Moltz Parkinson's had um, become quite severe. And so they decided to retire and they moved to Southwest Harbor where um, they lived with um, my mother-in-law's father. And interestingly enough, the first time I went to Southwest Harbor, well, I think it's interesting, um, while Winifred were living there, Pa John, her father was living there. And also at that time, Annette was there visiting. And that's how I first got to know grandmother. And so there, think of the household, to the mother of, the, of Winifred, the a father of Winifred, the mother of Moult, living together in this household with Moult and Winifred, uh, and getting along beautifully. Grandmother seemed to have knack for making everyone feel comfortable, just as Moult had. I can remember the first time I met him, I, Kent brought me to a bridge party, of all things, to bring a waitress from the Claremont Hotel. We went to a bridge party so I could meet his parents, and I was, well, you can, I was petrified, <laughs> absolutely petrified. The only person who was able to handle the situation gracefully was Walt, and he immediately made me feel comfortable, just as his mother did when I met her. So it was a very interesting household. Uh, they stayed with Padron for a number of years, moving to Otisville in 1960 uh, and buying the house on Belle Hill that you all know. Walt died in 1970, uh, well-loved and well-respected gentleman. Um, I just want to refer to Grandmother just another time, and that is from the time I met John Stockbridge and Kemp, I met them the same summer where I was waitressing, um, I heard about Grandmother and I heard about books and I heard about reading, and how Grandmother read Treasure Island over and over and over again, and how she had endless patience with her grandchildren. 
And before I, Kemp would marry me and bring me into the Paul family officially, I had to read his childhood books, including Treasure Island. <laughs> so this education business came all the way through and was very much a part of, of any one of us who were connected with the Pauls. Uh, my turn again. Um, I need my notes though, so I'm going to run back again now. Uh, uh, Nellie, Nellie Pottle was the uh, first girl in the family. She was five years younger than her brother Moult, who was the next oldest. Um, she married John Hankins in 1930, and of course, this is Annette showing there. Nellie was. Nellie was a model daughter in a lot of ways. She went to Colby, she did very well, she was never a problem, she worked hard, she was Phi Beta Kappa, uh, and that could write to Nellie and say, check on Stella, check with her French person, see how she is doing. And Nellie would, I have all these letters, Nellie would write back while well, I saw Professor so and so, and he says that Stella is perfectly bright and perfectly good student, but she needs to study hard. I mean, of course, and that's what they always say. Um, Nellie, I think, um, lived in somewhat in imitation of her brother Fred. She very much admired her brother Fred, and she followed his pattern a great deal. Uh, they both went to Colby, of course. She was Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, she, she went to Yale later for her graduate work in English. Eventually she got a PhD in English. Uh, she was a teacher. Um, she also lived with Fred uh, for at least once, maybe more than once, uh, in New Haven while she was getting her master's at Yale. Um, but Nellie did, Nellie, when she got through Colby, said she wanted to do something different. She wanted to do something a little special. There was this independent, idealistic bent to Nellie. And what she did was she became a missionary to a school for black girls in Atlanta, Georgia, the Spelman College. Uh, which had been founded, or at least uh, subsidized, by John D. Rockefeller. Nellie went down there and taught for two years. She taught biology, and she taught English to black girls. These were privileged black girls. These were upper crust black girls, if you can imagine. Uh, it was a real education, not just for the black girls, but also for Nellie. She learned a lot about herself, about race relations. She forgot that she was teaching black girls after a while, and she, uh, that the, the racial thing became uh, invisible to her. Uh, at one point, she was waiting for a subway, uh, at a subway stop for the, for the trolley car to come along, and uh, they assumed that she was black because she got on the Spelman stop for the bus or the subway. And so she was supposed to sit in the back. And this, this was the confusion here. She went to a concert along with a lot of Spelman girls. The usher didn't know what to do with her when she walked in. The other people were black. And here was this woman that looks white. Was she supposed to go off the balcony with the black girls? Or was she supposed to go down front with the whites? I can't remember how they resolved that, but you can see that she was kind of caught between two different worlds. She stayed down there two years. Um, and as I said, her, her mother came down and served as a house mother the second year she was there. I think for Annette, it was not as much of an experience as it was for Nellie. But after uh, Nellie's second year, uh, she came back and went off. She needed a teaching job. She went off to the academy, and where her brother Moult was established as dean. Uh, Nellie's job, well, Nellie was dean, which meant she had to keep uh, the kids disciplined. 
Her brother Moult and his young family was living at one end of the hall. Nellie was living at the other end of the hall. And her job was to keep the students away from Moult. <laughs> uh, she hated it. Uh, she did not do a very good job. She said she hated the discipline. Uh, she never was a very good disciplinarian. She always spoiled my children pretty badly. Uh, never disciplined. Um, after one year at Lee, she left and decided to follow Fred's example and go, and, and go back to Yale. And uh, got her, she got her master's. Uh, she met John Hankins there, uh, a native of South Carolina who was earning his PhD in English. And she met him when she uh, had been studying very hard at the Yale Library and apparently fainted one evening. And John Hank is being a polite, good southerner, uh, threw some water on her. <laughs> um, he then decided that he would walk her home to Professor Pottle's house, and the romance uh, began. Uh, she actually turned him down. He proposed once, she turned him down, but he persevered, and um, they were married in 1930. Um, before that, though, she uh, went off to teach, like her brother Fred. She got her master's. She went off to teach, not just anywhere, but the University of New Hampshire, where he had taught. He was, wasn't there then, uh, but she was following the pattern. Uh, I even found an application she never sent in to Deering High School in Portland. She was applying for a teaching job there because he had taught there too. It was kind of interesting seeing this parable uh, thing. But she did break with the family tradition by marrying someone from outside New England. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Callie, whose mother was not Nellie, not a model student always, and a different came from a different, uh, a, a different um, lifestyle. Not a different lifestyle, but the picture. <laughs> <laughs> this is Okay, this is Stella and her husband, Ellis, who many of you know. Oh, yes. In front of the same old elm tree, in front of the same old house. Um, and that's probably Elizabeth Ann, the mother is holding, I would guess, uh, at that point in time. I don't know how my mother grew up to be normal, to be honest. I, uh, she was the, the baby. Uh, I suspect she got a certain degree of spoiling from all those big brothers, and certainly from her big sister. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of endearing names that, that they use with, with each other, and you can, you can uh, I have a suitcase full of letters, and you can hear the affection in the letters as they communicate back and forth. And Aunt Nellie and mother and grandmother, the ladies of the family, stayed very, very tight. And though those letters are so rich with all of those um, fun stories. But mother um, was only seven years old when her father died. And then um, they stayed at home for those first several years. He died in 1914, as you've heard. And they were there on the farm until 1917. Um, and the older boys, uh, some were still there, so grandmother was able to stay there uh, because the, the farm could be managed. Um, and uh, so mother turned into this uh, sort of will-of-a-wisp tomboy on the farm, and uh, when her true heart showed as an older woman, she was still a, a tomboy at heart. And um, she had an old horse named Madge that she adored, and so in 1917, they picked up and grandmother went to Hebron and stayed there until 1922. Mother would have been 10 years old. They took the horse because I don't think my mother was going to go without it. And they made an arrangement uh, at Hebron that mother could have the horse if they could use the horse and keep it active. And that was all right. It worked pretty well until one day mother disappeared. And I, I hear a great deal of homesickness with my mother out for a while and she got on old man and rode back to Oldsby. and it was quite late in the day before she got back and they finally put together the horse was missing the girl was missing <laughs> probably they were both in this field so they just kind of had to wait and see what happened and she showed up um, so mother was there from 1917 until 1922 at Hebron and um, did her grade school years there 
Uh, her sister then left in 1921 to go on to Kobe. So uh, she and grandmother then, as you remember, moved to Durham, New Hampshire. Mother uh, did that. So she had two years of high school under her belt um, when she left in, uh, to go to Durham. She got the third year at Durham. And then I, and grandmother goes to Winthrop. Mother gets her fourth year in high school at Winthrop. So the poor little girl kind of uh, had to um, had to adjust. But throughout this whole thing, I guess she talks about going home for Christmas. Well, she was going to leave where John lived, and because grandmother was up there. So I think home was where grandmother was uh, for her. So um, she got done uh, at Hebrew and went to Colby College in 1924, like all her siblings graduating in 1928. Um, she was not a terrible student, but she was not, I remember one story uh, that probably hurt her feelings considerably, but one of the professors who had had um, the boys and Aunt Nellie, uh, she was struggling with something in math or French or whatever, and they said, I can see you are not as your brothers, Miss Potter, <laughs> in class in front of all the other students. So, um, but she, I, 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 I came across uh, rank cards from Hebron, and she was not a disaster by any stretch. But she, she did had a, she had a tough road to uh, role to follow. Uh, she graduated in 1928. Um, there is one poignant little letter that talks about her being in the infirmary. Grandmother is off up in Lee, I think, or maybe further away. She has the measles, so she has to be taken care of in the infirmary with that. Um, after graduation, she had followed the family track of becoming a teacher, and she decided she found, she found a job. This was 1928 probably wasn't the easiest thing. She went to Denny'sville. If you know where Denny'sville is, it's way up in Cobb's Bay, almost into New Brunswick. So that was her first teaching experience. Um, there, uh, and she was. I always thought my mother taught grade school, and she taught high school there. And she taught, like Uncle John, French and Latin and math and uh, whatever came up. She was expected to do and did it and liked it there uh, quite well, I think. And she did two years. And for whatever reason, uh, in 1930, uh, decided to change venues and went to Richford, Vermont. Well, that's about as far as Cobbs Cook Bay. It was just south of a border crossing uh, into Quebec. And there was not much else up around there. So she was in Richford, Vermont, Richford, Vermont, for uh, a year. Again, the same sort of outlay of courses to teach. She really didn't like it very much, and I wasn't. She said she liked the, the students, and she liked the teachers. I think maybe the administration was a little bit of a problem for her, and um, they didn't offer her a raise. She was only making fourteen hundred and five dollars for the year, and she thought she should have a raise the second year. And of the, I think, seven or eight teachers that were there, the only two people that got a raise were those that were still under $1,300. So uh, she packed up and went home, and she didn't have a job, and she was a little worried about that, but not so terribly that she didn't do it. And uh, so she got home. Her grandmother, again, was gone. She was not there at the farm, and she uh, wrote that, that she was not going to continue, and I even... There was a quote I came across that said, I would rather wash dishes than go back there. Uh, so she, she didn't really want to stay. Um, so she came back to Otisfield, and she's writing to her mother that um, she really needs to find some work. And she spent most of the summer, I don't know doing what, because she wasn't back at the farm. But she, she showed up in Otisfield in September, early, and uh, started to talk to the teachers around in town, and she talked to um, the teacher here at East Otisfield, and come to find out they needed someone rather badly up on the Otisfield Gore. So uh, mother taught on the Otisfield Gore. Um, she taught all eight grades. Um, I kept a little letter because it tells you a little bit. Uh, she she um, had written to her mother that she had landed the job. And then this is three days later. This is September 23, 1931. Three days have gone and I am still alive. I like my children very much, and I think I have no terribly dull ones, which is a help. There are 13 in all, ranging from primary to eighth grade. I have no first, fourth, or sixth grades. I don't know what I would do if I did, because I find it practically impossible to get them all in as it is. I have Junior Greenleaf, I thought some of you might recognize some of these names, two Brackett children, two Townsends, a Thomas, 
two Linnells, uh, McKean, two McKeans, a McAllister, and two boys who are living with four people, a Hayden and a Curtis boy. The Curtis boy lives with the McCains and the Hayden boy uh, with the Yorks. So she goes on to tell you know what what she's teaching and how how uh, she likes it and enjoys it and she stays uh, teaching on the Gore from 1931. Um, she gives me a little bit of a challenge on keeping track of just where she was till the spring of 1935. So she stuck with that for a while. She was living at the farm uh, a fair amount of the time by herself because grandmother she was a grown woman now she was out of school and teaching. And uh, grandmother still did her visiting to the various other families. So the letters, there's lots of letters because grandmother is not the same place she is. Um, so then uh, in 19, she did that until 35. In 1935, she went to Lawrence, Kansas. And I didn't have time to go through all those letters, but I think she went to help Aunt Nellie take care of children. That was her third child was born in 1935. Yes. 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 And so. so she already had two children. Uncle John was a busy professor, and uh, I don't think Aunt Nellie was working, or might have been. The story I heard, if I could interrupt, yeah. was that she taught Margaret how to read. Margaret was only four uh, when, when her youngest brother, Dave, was born. So she taught Margaret to read, and that was the reason Margaret skipped all those grades and got through school so fast. Who, your mother did? Your, your yeah. mother did. Yeah. So I, the only thing I could deduce was that she was there to help. Yep. And uh, so she was, she was there in Lawrence for that whole year, from uh, fall of 35 to spring of 36. And then she came home, and she shows up in Denmark teaching, uh, Denmark, Maine. And uh, I wouldn't have been surprised. Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, she taught in Denmark, I think, uh, for a year. And then she went back to Denny'sville, where she taught two years before, and she taught the better part of another two years. She taught from fall until um, yeah, 37 until January of 1938. Well, the little story behind that, why she didn't finish that year, was that in the meantime, she and my father, Anne and my father, eloped. Um, and that was in September of 1938. And they took dad's father, Harry Stone, and mother's mother, Annette Pottle, and they went off to New Hampshire and they got married. And uh, they eloped because they couldn't admit that she was married at Denny'sville or they would have fired her. Because they didn't want any of those young women who were going to have babies and leave them in the lurch um, doing that. So, um, then, and to be a little crass, I think people all watching very carefully to see uh, that first baby was going to come. <laughs> and with Elizabeth Ann, and she hung on beautifully. And she so, uh, that was, uh, I could just hear my father saying, <laughs> she had to into. Uh, but um, she then, so she stopped, she taught until January of 1939, and was born in June, so she pulled it off pretty well. She did not stay for the second semester, needless to say. So that was the year she went from Miss Pottle to Mrs. Stone. Um, then um, June, between June of 1939 when Anne was born, and April of 1942 when I was born, which was slightly less than three years, uh, mother and dad had three children, and that pretty well took care of mother's professional career as a teacher. Uh, and after that, um, can I show that picture? Oh, uh, I think you put it back in the envelope. The three of us. Um, she she yeah. came back to the farm then, where, where she was exceedingly happy. All the years that she was away, you hear in her letters the and Aunt Nellie's too. The Mayflower was a blossoming in Otisfield. Wouldn't you love to have a Mayflower? And those kinds of things you could tell she, they, she, they really longed for home. And so she, it was with great joy, I'm sure, that she moved back. And she and Dad were able to move into the farm with Grandmother. And that was the relationship until Grandmother died in 1958. Um, um, and uh, she was gone a lot, but she was, and we were a little protective of Grandmother because we really felt she was ours. She lived, <laughs> we lived with her, and she, we really kind of wanted her to stay in Otis Field. Um, but she wandered off, and she'd come back, and we'd go over to the Oxford Station, and the train would come in, and it was so exciting that she was coming home. So it was really a wonderful uh, life. They settled in a married life on the little farm. Dad had a small herd of dairy cattle. He farmed all day and worked all night in the woolen mill in Oxford. 
Um, the mother was very active in the church and in the ladies' sewing circle. She was treasurer of the church for 40 years. I um, was honored for that when she left. She did recertify to teach uh, in the 50s after Dad sold our herd of cattle. If you could call ten head of cattle herd. Um, that she that didn't work for her anymore with uh, children at home, and it had been quite a while since she taught, and she. She did it for a little bit and then decided to, to, to stop here in East Otisfield. And, but she did tutor a number of children uh, from the area. Uh, she enjoyed home more than any other place in the world. She loved her children, her grandchildren. After Dad retired, they did have an opportunity to travel some. Um, and uh, then uh, and Mother started to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's, oh, probably, obviously, in the uh, late 80s and she died in 1993 following sort of a long difficult decline with Alzheimer's and my dad uh, took marvelous care of her. My reflections about uh, this whole thing was that first of all these letters are marvelous things to have and I think about email today and I think where are those letters going to be uh, you know for the next generation because it's such we all have them. We have this uh, you know from I have my first one from grandmother is in 19, I mean in 1894, uh, writing back to her sister Bessie Kemp on the, up here on Scrivener Hill, and goes until the day she died. And it's a, just a marvelous, um, marvelous information for the family, wonderful information for the historical society. I mean, it's rich in, uh, you have to be a little careful because it's always, there's a little uh, gossiping that goes on when mothers and daughters are, are, uh, are uh, writing. Uh, but um, mother was a wonderful, gentle, loving, caring uh, mother and wife, and I suspect a lot of that came from the example she'd been set by her mother. So, okay. thank you. Just going to sum up uh, for a minute, and uh, I, all those letters, uh, I've read an awful lot of uh, grandmother Nettie's letters, and um, Nellie, Nellie Hankins was always a very tactful, kind person who never said anything derogatory about anybody. So her letters aren't very interesting. But <laughs> 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 grandmother did. Uh, <laughs> and grandmother would make caustic comments, for example, about the Bean family <laughs> and, the, and the person that they were running for the school committee. And Oh, the minister. That, that was a much more interesting. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to close with uh, the picture of the family camp, Losecum, on Lake Thompson. I mentioned that uh, the Nettie Pottle, uh, when her husband died, had some worthless shoreland. And a part of that shoreland was in Otisfield Cove. I think she did sell some of that land off. I haven't got any proof of it, but, but that's the story that she did sell pieces of land off as she needed money. But she held on to this piece of land in Otisfield Cove. And uh, she didn't actually hold on to it. It was part of her son Malt's land. Uh, Malt Pottle owned from Scribner Hill all the way down across the Coon Road, a Cobbs Hill Road, all the way down to the lake. But he owed Grandmother Pottle some money. And that's the story I've heard. And so she said, Malt, instead of paying me back, why don't you deed over that piece of land in Otisfield Cove to the, your brothers and sisters? It was, there was an old family camp there, Kemp Brothers Camp. We have pictures of built in uh, 18, about 1890 that was falling apart. Um, the family wanted to replace that camp. So Malt did this. He deeded this piece of property over to his brothers and sisters, so it was owned by the five of them. And then the five brothers and sisters together built a log cabin. Uncle John Kay was the, uh, one of the primary workers on this. He was good at log cabins, but members of the Carroll family uh, also um, at Winifred was a Carroll. Some of the Carroll family also came down and worked on it on this log cabin. It's a real log cabin. Um, so that is that is kind of a symbol of of the family, and it's also kept the family together. I think 
is now owned by a family trust. Some of these people have, are trustees or presidents, and uh, it has kept the family coming back to Otisphere. More than that and grandmother's example, both, I think, of this inter <coughs> interconnected family. Um, so that, that's pretty much what I have to say, but I'm sure you have questions, so. Questions, yes. Jim. Well, I got a couple of comments, not really questions, but uh, kind of a couple of comical little things about, well, we always call him Old John, but when, when he was teaching at Oxford High School, uh, he also coached softball and, and girls basketball, and the Milligan family, who owned the place where I am now, the two oldest girls were on his softball team, Rosie and Eileen, and Kyle, historically, their father was one of the first ones to start haying around here and always, and he cut some hay one year in, in May, was right during softball season. So one night the girls, uh, he had some hay down that was ready to bail and the girls after school had to tell John that they wasn't going to be able to play in the game that night because they had to go home and help their father hay. And, Old John told the girls, he said, well, you go home and tell your father that you're not supposed to be cutting hay in May. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the, the other ones, there might be some folks in this room that remember it, but uh, the last year that John was the town moderator at town meeting, and when it used to be town meetings were down here at the community hall, this was uh, somewhere in the middle 70s, but when we lived over here, uh, we got ready to start the town meeting, they couldn't find his gavel, his wooden gavel, so somebody walked up and handed him a, uh, an empty Coca-Cola bottle, <laughs> and I just remember it being kind of funny, you see him watching him bang on that podium with that Coke bottle. <laughs> There's actually a picture of that with the Coke bottle in hand. Oh, there really? is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, comments, uh, reminiscences? Yeah. My, my grandmother, Kimball, um, had 10 children, and um, she would come and spend several months at our house and then go on to somebody else's house and just, well, so she, you know, just moved, people moved around, that, um, yeah. you know, visiting her, her children uh, in her um, later years. But do people do that anymore? Uh, I don't think so. Not so, not so much. I'm pretty sure you wonder if it wasn't yeah. something that was fairly yeah. common in those days. Well, I think, I think that would have been in the, um, yeah, 50s. I think it depended on the woman, too. Yeah. The woman was on the farm, and I was real small, but by the late 50s, yeah. she was not living alone at the farm anymore. And probably these women were very useful to taking care of children, helping with cooking. Uh, I know when, um, when, when my mother-in-law came to visit, she always did all my ironing and all my mending. Um, she used to darn socks, darn socks anymore. Uh, you know, she was very useful. I think that's why we all kind of clamored to have grandma the uh, you, are, you know, she was a godsend at our house. She was the inside mother, and mother was mother was milking cows at night with three little, you know, toddlers running around. So she was really in the early years. I'm sure when she traveled, when her children were having young children, and she sewed and made jackets and coats and dresses. And you once told me that you had two mothers: an inside mother and an outside exactly mother. Exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. The thing that amazes me about the stories of her traveling was, you know, I couldn't stand to do that traveling today. Uh, and I'm just wondering about, you know, the, the circumstances. How long did it take to travel uh, to Georgia, for example? Yeah. And, and she didn't have the benefit of frequent fly a mile. They went by train. She, she never, I don't think she, grandmother ever learned to drive. Did, did, did she, so they went by train, and uh, she would go take the train to Kansas, and then the Hankins family would bring her back with them when they came for the summer. That was the and what, what would be a, a train ride to Kansas back then? You know, a well, week. Well, she had to tra change trains in Chicago. I know we were always concerned 
where my mother was concerned about her changing. You know, if she got through Chicago, she figured she'd be all right. Or, <laughs> like going Dance. through O'Hare, I, I could relate to that. Yeah. Is there anything else? Yeah, I think the Annette gene passed on at least to Elizabeth Ann because uh, when she visits her children, uh, she takes over a lot of those duties too. And they absolutely love to see her come, especially Missy in Seattle. <laughs> They'd like to see me come, but they are, they, that's the useful one right there. <laughs> well, that, that was fun doing the family. We've been having a lot of fun uh, sharing pictures and sharing stories and uh, other things. It's, and Chris brought this. this uh, I have never, it's written by Nellie Hankins. I recognize her handwriting. I have never seen it before. He said, oh, you've got a copy of that, don't you? I said, no, I've never seen it before. It's been in your house all these years. Yep. She didn't make another copy. So Hankins is, uh, didn't have an awful lot of money, and so the, the thing was, what would they do for Christmas for all of us people up here in New England? Uh, and uh, what they did was, as a family, make something. I still have my towel, I call it the Kit Towel. My name was Kit, I was called Kit. And I have a towel with the Camp Losecum logo on it and Kit written on the other side. And it dates from like 1944 or something like that. I've treasured that towel. That were our Christmas presents went. And another year a set of sheets with the, with the Losecum logo on it and then one year Nani, Penny, and Mr. Flint showed up. <laughs> the nice thing about that old cot cabin is that uh, when be just before Dad died, he was the last of the ten, you know, the the, the children and and their spouses, and uh, the uh, probably Lydia's babies. We had five generations present in that camp and often on the 4th of July we'll have 50 people for dinner and you know that that physical place as well as the family communications has really kept a very large extended family together where third cousins know each other which is I think a little unusual and traditions are very strong yeah you have to have certain things for example on the 4th of July grasshopper uh, you've got to have grasshopper well <laughs> you've got to have feather stew which was uh, Uncle John's wife's creation. It used to be made from whatever birds they managed to shoot, but uh, we now make it with chicken. And uh, you have to have uh, watermelon at the end of the meal because Uncle Fred and Aunt Marion always brought watermelon. And you have to have pies, and if you don't have at least ten pies, you're in real trouble. You need to have at least that. And that tradition runs all the way through uh, the family history, I think. Yeah, there's one more picture uh, I'm going to talk about. You brought this, didn't you, Chris? Yeah. It's uh, grandmother in the foreground with uh, one, ch all her grandsons. And I won't try to tell you who all the grandsons are, but uh, some of them are here tonight. So, uh, Very uh, nice. Anyway, that's <laughs> the big family, yeah. So. Okay. We should put there, if anybody wants to look at these pictures more closely, yeah. and remember people, feel free. Thank you. There are some cookies. This is a question. Gordon has a question. Gordon has a question. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh. I just wondered if the, the other book yes. on the table, <laughs> yes. did you get that at the library? Uh, stretchers? I think this was in the That's library. long out of print, but I, I would suspect uh, that it would certainly be at the Oxford Library. The Oxford Library? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I have a copy I'd be happy to look at too. I think we all have a copy. Yeah. Oh yeah, we were here. Yeah. 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 Yeah